Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and I'm happy as always to be here with my great friend Joe Stanley. Welcome, Joe. Darcy, it is always a joy to be here with you. The sun is shining, we've got a fantastic show coming up and we're just raring to go. Have indeed, Joe, including a local medico who has a major breakthrough for the treatment of prostate cancer. It's a great story, giving new hope to Aussie men and we'll chat to the team behind this great innovation. Heinz vows to turn one of the country's top dessert chefs onto kale. Now, let's face it, everyone hates kale, Dars, <laughs> so he might be biting off more leafy greens than he can chew. And Gus Wallen is here to tell us, don't worry alone. He came up with the slogan with his great friend Hugh Jackman and he's using it to help Aussie blokes in the bush. Another great story. Paul and Tammy Roos are back to deliver a masterclass in finding more meaning in your life. And some great things coming up, Joe. but I want to start by talking about restrictions. Melbourne has been in stage four for almost three months now with no real end in sight until late November, possibly Christmas, Joe. so it's been a challenging time. Yes, businesses in particular are frustrated by the slow pace of reopening. Cafes, bars, hairdressers, gyms are all affected. And one we don't hear much about is construction. It's one of the many industries that's been hit hard. While it's remained classed as an essential service throughout the pandemic, there's been far-reaching disruptions and delays on build sites across the country. As the managing director of a multinational infrastructure company, B. Noonan oversees massive builds and hundreds of staff. He's been frustrated by what's happened to his industry under the current restrictions. And I caught up with Bede about his plan to kickstart the industry. Tell us about what uh, you've come up with to try and solve some of the issues around COVID-19 and uh, been able to get your workforce back in place. When the stage four lockdown was sort of starting and uh, many of us were frustrated and, and anxious, um, I just started thinking about uh, there's got to be some ways to, to work through and come up with some solutions. And of course, being you know, project management construction, it's sort of what are the practical tools that can be used. We've already got a system where every employee's got a card with a QR code on it. So then we worked out that to be able to have every person coming on be issued with a disposable mask, wear that mask for two or three hours uh, so that we get the right level of um, capturing of, of uh, work, you know, of loading on that mask. Uh, and then they come back in, in a staggered way, back into the, um, the lunchroom area and they get registered between their, their QR code, uh, a Ziploc bag. They do that themselves and we scan both so that, that connects their, their card with the bag. They then walk through, take their own mask off, put it into the Ziploc bag and put the bag into a bin. And then the Prenza guys take those masks, take them back to their Hawthorne lab. They then go through a process of swabbing uh, the mask, the inside of the mask in a, in a very laboratory-like environment um, and then take the swabs to the Eurofins lab in Dandenong. And at that point, the Eurofins lab conducts a normal, what's called a PCR test, which is exactly the same test as, as what many of us have had when we've had our nasal swabs at hospitals and so forth. But the only difference being to cope with a large number of tests, we actually group them into a groups of five. So we test five effective swabs at once, which means that for um, 400 tests, uh, we're only doing uh, 80 tests in the lab. And so therefore we're reducing our cost and we're increasing the speed of being able to get the test results. And Eurofins were testing um, those tests, all those tests in six hours. So effectively a worker comes in at seven, has their mask taken off for around 10, the swabs are then taken and the results are out by 9 p.m. at night. Enormous peace of mind for the workforce, as you can imagine, having that sort of information given back to them in that sort of speed. Is it something that, uh, you know, is it going to be something you could roll out in other industry? I don't think that test itself is probably something that we'll roll out because I think there'll be antigen tests and other tests that are really going to be available very soon. But what was the most important ingredient of what we did, Luke, was establish a logistical process for doing fast and widespread testing. So what we've done with chain of control and record keeping is just as important as the mask uh, swab testing itself. You're confident in other businesses that this is a pathway out that we're looking for? In the construction industry, we need workers to be able to work across sites. You know, all of the trades, they're not on one site yeah. for four months. They, they are moving sites every single day. So 
I need my workforce on my side to be safe today and tomorrow, and then those workers to be able to move to other company sites. Yep. So we need to be able to share things um, across industries, in, uh, across companies and sites in our industry. And I think if we can do that in construction, it, there's no reason, and we're probably the most one of the most dynamic industries you can imagine because of the movement of workforce on a daily basis. So if we can do it, other industries can absolutely do it in more static environments. Construction generates 9% of Australia's total GDP. It also employs over 1.15 million people and is such a vital pillar of the economy that needs a boost to keep going, Joe. Yeah, it really does. The government announced the $25,000 home builder grants in June for people to build or do large-scale renos on their homes. But like with so many sectors of the economy, we have to look at ways people can get back to work safely long-term. And up next, a Melbourne innovation is giving new hope to men with prostate cancer. We chat to the team behind it right here on The House of Wellness. A very special place that we're incredibly proud of is Victoria's Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. As a global leader in cancer research and treatment, their sole purpose is to find better care and potential cures for cancer, Jo. They just do amazing work, Dars, which now includes groundbreaking new treatment for prostate cancer. It's to help men with an advanced form of the disease and is showing some extraordinary results. Anton, welcome. Thank you for your time today. Can I start by asking when were you diagnosed with prostate cancer? I was diagnosed in 2012, and uh, yeah, I had a PSI test, and it was quite high, and uh, become it was very suspicious, and uh, then I had a biopsy done, and uh, yeah, it was established that I had a uh, prostate cancer. So your diagnosis uh, eight years ago now, and you had several different treatments. Can you briefly just explain what you'd been doing to treat it previously? One of the treatment that I started in Peter McCullough Hospital was uh, chemotherapy and docetaxel. And in my case, it did nothing. It absolutely did nothing. It didn't help me at all. Can I ask you, Anton, what was your response when you first heard about this radical treatment? Uh, what it does, it, it goes and sticks uh, onto, the, onto the prostate cancer cells. And it does it so good, it's not, not funny. But when you look at the way this works, um, it is amazing. And I do feel much better, much better. I, you know, prostate cancer is a s sort of disease which burdens you. It it's, uh, becomes uh, sort of, you feel weight on your bones and all that, which is all gone now. Uh, great news. Have you seen your scans since the treatment and, and what do they show? Yeah, the scans are showing that, uh, you know, uh, they told me volume of, uh, of disease and uh, and the PSI. They seem to have gone down uh, something like over 95% anyway. So, you know, I was amazed. And I think doctors were quite amazed with me as well. So I'm a nuclear medicine specialist at uh, Peter Mac. Uh, in Melbourne, and we are using some radioactive substances, uh, both to diagnose and also to treat cancers. And in recent time, uh, I've been focusing my research on improving outcomes for men with uh, prostate cancer. How would you describe it as being different from previous treatments? So this is quite a unique form of treatment. It's called uh, theranostics. So the way this works is we give an intravenous injection into a vein of a radioactive substance. It's quite a clever radioactive substance because it binds specifically to prostate cancer. So it travels around the bloodstream, binds to prostate cancer cells wherever they are in the body. And we're using this in men where the prostate cancer has metastasized or spread. Uh, that's often to bones or sometimes to lymph nodes. So it travels around the body uh, like a homing device, finds these cancer cells, binds to the cancer cells, is taken up into the cancer cells we can then put the patients on a PET scanner, which is a special whole body imaging device and get some extraordinary three dimensional images. And these show us the tumor spread throughout the whole body, wherever it happens to have gone. And if the uptake is high, it suggests that we can also treat the patients with a similar compound. And to do that, we just change the radioactive label. We use the same compound, but rather than a, a type of radioactive 
radioactivity that passes out of the body, which the scanner detects. We change to a radioactive substance which travels only a few millimetres but deposits really high amounts of energy to kill the cancer cells. So this is a really targeted form of treatment. It's very different than chemotherapy. Uh, we can both uh, visualise what we treat and then uh, treat the cancer wherever it has spread. So it's quite a remarkable form of treatment. How have uh, the trials gone so far? Yeah, so we've been doing this treatment at Peter Mac for five years. And when we uh, started doing this treatment, we were taking men who had really progressed after all forms of standard therapies, chemo chemotherapy, other sorts of hormonal therapies, really when the oncologists had nothing left to offer. And we were treating them with this novel treatment and seeing really some extraordinary results, even in the men who had progressed after three, four, sometimes five lines of standard therapies. Short time ago, we spoke to uh, Anton, one of your uh, patients who appears to be doing incredibly well. Can you tell us uh, about his case? Yeah, so Anton is, is a patient who had progressed after a type of chemotherapy called uh, docetaxel, and he'd also had a uh, hormone treatment and uh, was reaching the end of the line. And... Uh, you know, traditionally may have just gone off to palliative care and had a symptom relief in his last uh, few months of life, but he found his way to this uh, clinical trial where we've given him the, the radioactive treatment, lutetium PSMA, in his case combined with an immunotherapy treatment as well. And his cancer had spread to bones and on his scans, uh, we can see that really all the bones in his body were as riddled with prostate cancer spread uh, by the time uh, he had come for this treatment and that was causing uh, pain but also just fatigue and, and general decrease in quality of life. And uh, what we saw with the treatment was really a major quick reduction in the tumour burden and he had uh, six cycles of this treatment and is now, you know, really back to normal well, didn't have much side effects from the treatment uh, as a bonus and is doing, you know, doing fantastic. He feels like he's, you know, having a second life. September is International Prostate Awareness Month, which aims to raise awareness and funds to help fight the disease. Some city landmarks will be lit up blue across the country and everyone's encouraged to wear a blue ribbon to support the cause. You can also light up your own home in blue for the cause or even a local landmark. Just head to the Prostate Cancer Foundation website to find out more. From lighting up Australia to brightening up your nails, and blue is a bit of a favourite of mine, here's the latest beauty buzz on how to get salon style at home. I don't know about you guys, but I think there's something a little bit empowering about having a beautiful pop of colour on your nails, especially with that fresh and shiny top coat. It can get a little bit frustrating and expensive to have to dash into a salon all the time, but I'm going to show you today how you can nail that perfect gel nail look at home with Sally Hansen's Miracle Gel Shiny Top Coat. It's just a two-step process to gorgeous nails without the need for any UV lamp. First, make sure your nails are clean and dry. Next, apply two coats of your preferred colour in Sally Hansen's Miracle Gel Colour. Allow the colour to dry for five minutes. Then apply one coat of the Miracle Gel Top Coat. The new and improved Colour Lock technology binds to colour for up to eight days wear and it can be easily removed with normal nail polish remover without causing the damage that sometimes salon visits can cause to our nails. Salon nails at home? I think we nailed it. And stick around as Gus Woolen tells Aussie blokes in the bush, don't worry alone. We find out about Gus's recent feel-good road trip next on The House of Wellness. One of our great friends is Gotcha for Life's Gus Wallen, and one of Gus's favourite places to be is out and amongst the people, helping boost the spirits and mental health of everyone he meets, Joe, and he couldn't do a better job. Yeah, this time Gus has corralled the state's rugby team and hit the country highways of New South Wales. He's been organising games with the locals and chats at the pub to check in with communities still doing it tough. Well, Gus wants anyone struggling with mental health worries to feel connected and know that they're not alone. Take a look. Well, one of my favourite people ever to catch up with is our mate Gus Warman from Gotcha for Life. Good to see you, Gus. How are you? Great to see you too, Luke. It's always a pleasure, mate. And tell me, what have you been up to? What's Gotcha for Life been doing in this 
challenging year. Yeah, it's a very, very tough time. There's no doubt about it. We're, we're having a big increase, unfortunately, in suicides and there's a lot of people not coping very well at the moment. So, Das, we've never been busier. Um, just trying to build as much mental fitness into Australia as we possibly can, letting people know that it's OK not to be OK, that we're all going through a period of time now. So just even if you bumble your way through the best you can, that's good enough. You know, let's chuck away perfect and let's just get through it and... I think we'll get through it through connection, letting people know that you're struggling and then you'll soon realise you're a part of a huge community that are going through exactly the same thing. Yeah, I love your messages, Gus. And I know you've been doing a lot of work in uh, the regional parts of Australia, which have been really badly affected. And share with me some of the stories from the bush that you've seen. Absolutely, yes. I was lucky enough, uh, Brad Fittler, you know, an NRL legend, he's the New South Wales State of Origin coach and he invites me to go out to the country with him. He does clinics with other sort of ex-blue uh, champions and then I just sort of shimmy around, talk to the parents, talk to the kids that are injured and then eventually we all get together and as the kids are sort of stretching and getting some, some water on board, I have a little chat about mental fitness and how... You look after each other on the field, communicate all the time with your tackling and your attack. But, you know, are you actually looking after each other off the field as well and building that mental fitness? There was one dad in particular, Luke, that I could just see hovering around me and I wasn't sure that he was ever going to come up and say day. So I walked over to him and said day, And he told me very, very quickly that he has four boys, but his youngest, who was 13, took his life on Christmas Eve. Now, when someone says something like that to you, you realise obviously it's not a normal conversation. So we jumped up into the grandstand and talked and he just spoke about the fact that he had brought up three boys the same way. Uh, he never told them he loved them. He never really hugged them. He was just an old school dad, I suppose, who just told them you work hard, you get what you get. Whatever you put in, you'll get out of life. And that worked for his first three kids, but it didn't work for this last boy. And he will never have a chance to say... Sorry to that lad. He'll never have a chance to change himself. And he now talks to the grave. And it's just so, so sad. And uh, after those particular nights, you go back to the motel and you realise no matter how tired you are, it's time to put your head down, bum up, get up the next morning and keep talking about mental fitness with people and keep talking and doing the best you can because these numbers are horrific. And uh, COVID, unfortunately, has given us a spike. Uh, it's such a tragic story, Gus, and, and I know, mate, when I'm around you, you're a great hugger. You always get a hug from you, and it doesn't come naturally to a lot of males. And, you know, I was at boarding school from the age of 13 or 14, and emotion's not necessarily a friend uh, back in those days, but I've really had to train myself too with my kids to, to say, you yeah, know, I love you, uh, give them a hug, you know, make sure that the emotions are there. It's You can practise it, can't you, Gus? It might not come naturally to you, but... You, you can you can put yourself out there a bit more. Of course, bearing our emotions, Luke, and talk and not talking about it has given us the situation we're in now, yeah. which is terrible. So we have to do something different, and that's why I like talking about mental fitness rather than mental health. It's just like physical fitness; we're always working on it. We're always working on yeah. stuff. So that's the absolute key. Something that doesn't come naturally to you, eventually it will, and hopefully yeah. your sons they'll take it to the next level, and your grandsons will get the benefit of you stepping up. Well, I always love chatting to you, Gus, for, for one of the many reasons, always inspired. Now, tell us about a commercial and a message that you've got going out there on Channel 7. What have you been up to? Absolutely fantastic. The Channel 7 phoned me at Gotcha for Life and said, we want to do a national campaign talking. It's the 30-seconder. We just want to start talking about it's OK not to be OK. And I am so pleased with the outcome. It's, there's no way a, a foundation like mine could ever afford to get a national TV uh, commercial. So Channel 7, huge thanks. Huge thanks to Chemist Warehouse as well that have put this together and I was just a small part of it, but hopefully it'll help everyone watching it and realising that everyone's going through stuff. Please don't do it alone. If you're not worrying alone, you're sharing it with someone and that could be enough just to save your life. So huge, huge um, tip my lid to Channel 7 and Chemist Warehouse for allowing me to do it. And I love your messages, Gus. Uh, you know, you get a text from Gus and it just says, I've got, I've got you for life. And, you know, as you said, you can turn a friendship into a lifelong friendship. You can be, you know, a better friend than you've been before. You can pick up the phone to an old friend. You can connect a little bit better with your kids. You can do something practically to be better with your partner, with your wife, with uh, all those that are close to you. So I always uh, get inspired, Gus. Got you for life. It's such a great legacy that you've uh, created. 
And uh, thanks, as always, uh, for joining us. We appreciate it. Hey, big, massive hug to you, big fella, <laughs> and, and everyone down there in Melbourne. We're really thinking of you. Thanks for your time, Lukey. I love that Gus uses sport, which is about fresh air, mateship and getting together, to then spark broader chats with people who might need a bit of prompting to open up. It's so clever and really beautiful. Yeah, I love it. Couldn't be more supportive. From looking after mental health to nourishing bodies, Luke and GQ are here with their tip on feeling good every day, and that's by going green. Greek Caesar Cobb Green. I mean, there are so many different types of salads out there. And whether it's a side dish or the main event, they are so good for you. And I reckon I've absolutely nailed it with today's shaved asparagus salad. I love that you're using asparagus, Heinze. My favourite way is to have it on its own, wrapped up in a little piece of bread, either neat or toasted. Oh, I tell you what, you're proving that asparagus is very, very versatile indeed. But did you know, GQ, that the asparagus stem takes three years to develop from seed to harvest? That's quite amazing. And it's a long time to develop the benefits because it actually is really important for gut health. And we want to focus on that today. Ready when you are, mate. Heinz, the asparagus is good for our gut because it's a prebiotic, which means it's food for the essential bacteria that hang out in our gut. Well, look, that makes sense. Like all living things, good bacteria need food to work. Absolutely, Heinzie. And it's important to remember that beneficial bacteria help maintain a healthy microbiome. Now, that's the trillions of bacteria that reside in our gut. So not only does it help keep our gut healthy, but it's also important to help us absorb nutrients in food. Well, you're right. There's no point eating all these healthy foods like asparagus if you're not going to absorb the nutrients. You're so true, Heinzie. And the important thing in all of this is as well as helping our general gut health, there's some really important functions as well. So things like immune health, digestive health, and even bowel movements, all supported by this small army of bacteria. Now, as well as providing food for the existing beneficial bacteria, we can actually ingest beneficial bacteria too, right? Yes, we can, Heinze, either as fermented food or as a probiotic and supplement form. Well, these asparagus spears might have taken three years to whip up, but I tell you what, my salad was a whole lot quicker. Time to feed that good bacteria. Wow, look at that. Hell for me. The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by LifeSpace. We can all be living innovation. And Heinz, he sticks with the green theme as he tries to turn us on to kale a bit later on. But up next, Paul and Tammy Roos coach us towards a more meaningful life right here on the House of Wellness. We often hear the phrase, bring more meaning to our life. But what does that really mean, Jo? Well, I think it's thinking about your impact on the world and the people that you engage with every day. Isn't that why we're here, to have a positive impact on our surroundings and all of the people that we meet along the way? I think perhaps, uh, particularly here in Melbourne, having so much time with our families and stripping back our lives, we probably have had a chance to contemplate uh, a little bit more of that, What's what it's all about, how we can live a better life, Joe. It's probably right. been a positive. Yeah, I agree. That's been a real blessing to have that time to pause and think about that. So much of our time is focused outward on our jobs, kids, friends and, you know, just stuff just fills our lives. So it's easy to get distracted and lose focus of what inspires us and really gets us going, especially at the moment. Yeah, you're right, Joe. Often it's easier said than done, but to help find the answers, who better to turn to than life coaches Paul and Tammy Roos? When was the last time you asked yourself the question, what has meaning for me right now in terms of what do I like and what I don't like? Where's my passion? And it's so fundamentally important to actually consider this question because most of us don't take the time to pause and really ask us what's going on right now. What am I feeling? What am I experiencing? Again, what do I desire to create? Think about how we live our lives. We're focused on our families, our careers, friends, the to-do list. It's not until we actually stop and consider these questions that we sit back and we go, wow, I'm not really sure. You know, that reflection pause where we journal 
and perhaps that's one technique that you use where you just pose the question on a piece of paper. Because once we have that meaning and our why, fundamentally it does create a path for us and we can go down that path feeling that sense of direction because that's where we're headed in what we desire to do. It's amazing how easy it is to go into a sense of flow, right? Because motivation does inspire us. By creating more meaning or our why, it will actually allow us to then step back into that sense once again of, I can enjoy this space. It's not meant to be about all hard work. Step into your power by becoming aware of what's going on in your inner world have that relationship with yourself and you will be far better for it. One of the questions I most get asked is how did I motivate the players? And my response often surprises people. I say, if I have to motivate the players, I've got the wrong group of players. And by that I mean they have to find their own motivation. And I really didn't care what motivated each and every player. Now for you it's the same. What really drives you in your day to day life? When your alarm goes off in the morning, what really fuels you to get out of bed? I've got two sons, two boys, and, and I say that to them all the time. Guys, I don't really care what you do, but you have to find your passion. And I believe if we all find our passion, then the world is gonna be a far greater place because we'll be fueled by that passion, we'll be fueled by that excitement, and we'll also give off that passion and excitement to other people that we come in contact with. So the question I will always ask is, what are you passionate about? What is your purpose in life? And let's not worry about what other people want you to do. Really drive yourself. What fuels you in your heart? What drives you? And if you find that, everything else will look after itself. I tell you, I so understand what Tammy is saying. Sometimes when I'm really busy with lots of things going on in my life, it's easy to become a bit scrambled and really lose sight of that end goal, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Sometimes you find yourself doing things you didn't really understand why. And it's mm. an easy thing to do, to do, Joe. And an interesting perspective from Paul there on motivation about finding out exactly what drives you. As a coach, he wasn't about so much motivating the players, as he said, they had to find their own motivation. And he really changed the way coaches dealt with their players, so Joe. was much more balanced and, uh, I suppose, took the whole person into account when he was an AFL coach. Yeah, such an inspiring mindset. So you know where I need a coach? Where's that? <laughs> when I'm on the laptop to tell me to stop because I can go for hours and because I'm concentrating, it's a real strain. I find myself actually doing this. On the, like it's, you know, not pretty and it's not good for my eyes. So I'm sure a lot of people are suffering from the same thing at the moment. So let's hear what one of our leading optometrists has to say about one of the most common eye complaints. The saying goes that the eyes are the window to the soul, but the eyes can also reveal a lot about our health. So whether you already know that you have a health condition, the eyes can be a good indicator as to how well you're controlling that. Or sometimes if you didn't even know that you suffered from a certain health condition, the eyes can be a sign that you need to go and get something checked. The tears are really important to our eyes. They help to lubricate the front of the eye. They protect the front of the eye as well. And they're also really important in maintaining clear, precise vision. Dry eye can be caused by your eyes not producing enough tears or the tears that are being produced being poor quality so that your tears evaporate too quickly. Well, some of the symptoms I've had with dry eyes are uh, itchiness, um, some blinking quite a lot. I think the cause of my dry eyes would probably be the fact that one thing, I've got long eyelashes, so whether it's a blessing or a curse. Um, I do use eye drops on and off. Generally, I try to look after my eyes by putting some glasses on when I'm outdoors, particularly on windy days. I guess the most frequent or notable condition is a scratchiness. That's the best way to describe it, where your eyes just feel a bit dry and crunchy. Um, and you tend to want to rub them a little bit to, I guess, lubricate them. Um, I think what causes dry eyes is um, the lack of moisture in your eyes, especially if you're in front of the screen um, and you don't actually have downtime for your eyes. I don't have no time for my eyes, pretty much, in front of the screen the whole day. I think these days the most common trigger for dry eye would probably be digital device use. Environments with heated or cooled air can also make people more prone to dry eye. 
There are lots of different symptoms of dry eye. They're widely varied. They include things like red eyes, sore eyes, itchy, watery, burning eyes, fluctuating vision as well. Dry eye is this vicious cycle of inflammation and the deeper you get into that cycle, the more work that both the optometrist and the patient need to put in to treat that dry eye. So the earlier you treat it, the simpler it is to treat. Lots of people don't actually know the correct way to use eye drops, so it's something that I really like talking about. So step one, as always, is to wash your hands with soap and water and then dry them. Then you need to pull down the lower eyelid of whichever eye you're applying the drops to. And this forms a little pocket between the eyelid and your eyeball. You can tilt your head back so that you're not going to waste the drop. And then you actually pop the drop into that little pocket that you've formed. I think if you've had any of the symptoms of dry eye, it's definitely worth having an eye exam with an optometrist. It's good to have one anyway to check on your general health, but they'll certainly be able to guide you in terms of what type of dry eye treatments that you might need or might be most successful for you. Up next, Heinze takes on the greatest cooking challenge ever, his mission <laughs> to make kale tasty. Can he do it? Find out right after this. Welcome back. Joe, foods and cooking have trends like most things. What's hot one day is quickly yesterday's news. Absolutely. Everybody was drinking celery juice at the start of this year. Where's that gone now? I mean... <laughs> Goji berries were the new superfood at one stage. Yes. Kombucha's been really popular mm. in recent times. What about turmeric lattes? I mean, why? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> What's the coffee that Heinze likes to drink? The, the bullet the coffee. Bullet Very trendy at the moment. Mm -hmm. mass, all the ancient grains... Mm -hmm. that uh, became quinoa and all those sort of things. Which brings me to kale, okay. uh, Joe. There are two schools of thought that it's bitter, it's stringy, hard to cook, everyone hates it like you, <laughs> or it is a nutrient-rich superfood that we should all eat more of. I think I pretty know which side you're going to fall on here. Look, all I'm saying is that every year it is my New Year's resolution to not only buy the kale but eat it, actually, before it turns yellow and wilts <laughs> in my fridge. <laughs> I haven't yet mastered that. Well, Heinze is pro the leafy green, as we know. He not only wants us to believe it tastes great, he's determined to prove it by making one of the country's top pastry chefs sweet on kale. Take a look. Now, chocolate's not something that you'd usually associate with kale, but look no further than these delicious choc chip kale cookies to get more of the great green stuff into your life. What I love about kale is that it's one of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. And when it comes to leafy greens, it is the absolute king. Kale's rich dark green colour proves that it's really jam-packed with polyphenols. Plus, it is a fantastic source of antioxidants, which help fight free radical damage. I mean, if you're going to have kale, you may as well have them with chocolate chips, right? Preheat your oven to 180 degrees and bake them for 7 to 10 minutes or until golden brown and crispy on the outside. If these cookies don't convince you that kale is delicious, I don't know what will. But as they say, the proof is in the pudding. And who better to give their opinion than the kale-hating punk princess of pastry, Anna Polyview. No to kale. Don't like kale. Look, you can send it as a crisp for me. Is that kale? That's OK, isn't it? It's that texture, it's that bitterness. But who knows, you know, we all know that Luke can cook and he's here to impress today and let's just see what he can create. But kale, really? Does anyone really like kale? Luke, it's always a pleasure to see you, but I'm also a bit worried and concerned about what we're about to eat. I've heard that your favourite food is kale. Oh. It, it's come down the grapevine, Anna, and I couldn't resist but do my triple threat, my trifecta of kale goodness. Tell me this. I know it's nutritional. Yeah. We all know that. Yeah. But the thing is, is it fashionable? Is it one of those vegetables that everyone is talking about, that everyone is saying, you've got to consume it, it's great for you, but then it's really just... Look, I hear what you're face. saying. You're thinking kale, you're thinking activated almonds, you're going down that path, I'm hearing Yes. It. But 2020, I reckon it's time we bring kale into the new millennium. Yep. And I reckon this is the way to do it. <laughs> 
Can you actually guess the flavour of that just by looking at it? Well, I obviously can tell raspberry, and we are talking about kale, so there's obviously kale in there. Yeah. You're not going to tell me there's chocolate in there, are you? It is a choc peanut butter banana split kale smoothie. Can you say that fast? Banana choc split. Yeah. I don't know, but now I want to have it. Isn't it funny when you tell me yeah. what's in there? Now I'm just like, I really want to have it. It's quite nice. You into it? It's different. But I'm, I'm imagining a dessert out of it, and that's exactly what I'm thinking. I wouldn't necessarily go back and dig into it. You're not going for seconds. Not overly, but, okay. I am, but I'm not also disliking it. Mm. How's that crunch? Mm. I'm hoping our mics pick that crunch up. I'm loving that. Yeah. I mean, I could also have that as a snack, couldn't I? It's a snack, it's a breakfast, lunch and dinner. I mean, you could wake up at midnight and get one out of the fridge and eat it in bed. I feel I felt nervous about this one in particular. Smoothie, give or take. Yeah. Fritters, that's my sweet spot. I'm definitely the fritter king. But serving up a cookie to you. What's in this? The queen of baking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very nervous. This? This? Is good. This has got the dessert queen's ears pricked. Oh, my God. Gluten-free, dairy-free, refined sugar-free. That cookie. Would you know that? Would you be able to pick that, that it was a healthy cookie? I wouldn't be able to. Because I've not just given you a sugary cookie with kale. I've given you a full healthified cookie with kale. So, my question, will kale be becoming a part of your life, Anna? I think I have enough greens in my life. <laughs> I don't need any more. But saying that, if you gave me the recipe for these two, yep. I would definitely use kale. All right, you've seen that now, Joe. <laughs> what do you think? Are you prepared to give kale a second chance? Well, I do love Anna Polyvu. I think she's amazing. Her desserts are beautiful and obviously they are her specialty. So I trust her. So whether I would uh, eat the kale, if she cooked it, yes. I don't mind kale chips as well, done in the oven with a bit of, you know, salt and olive oil, but that's probably as far as I go. Fried kale's probably cheating a little bit, isn't it? Mm. Anything from... Fair call, Joe. Anna actually started her career as a savoury chef before she entered a pastry competition that completely changed her life. Her desserts are absolutely to die for. She's a multi-award winning chef and worked in the world's best venues, Sydney's Bathers Pavilion and the Shangri-La Hotel. No offence to Heinze, but next time I'd like Anna to make us something sweet. <laughs> really? No arguments on that one, Joe. <laughs> Up next, a snapshot of AFL hero Simon Black when he takes on the 60-second slam right here on The House for Wellness. I'm pretty relaxed to think, um, but I'm also competitive um, and I like to think I'm an optimist. Probably West Coast Eagles. I was a Perth boy and they were my team growing up. Robbie Gray from Port Adelaide. I just love the way he can play forward, he can play as a midfielder, he's a gun. Oh, I used to get me called the tortoise late in my career because I, <laughs> I was so slow. <laughs> I don't like running on concrete much these days. Surfing. Find something that you're passionate about and give it your best shot. That was Brisbane Lions superstar and now assistant coach Simon Black there. He's a true superstar, Joe. One of the best midfielders you've ever seen before. One of Brownlow. Many thought I should have maybe won it that year, Joe, but we'll move on from that. I know you don't want to I'm hear really that story. I'm really worried for you. I feel like you can't get past the fact that Simon Black stole your brown loaf. It was only 18 years ago, Joe, and yeah. I, you know, haven't quite moved on just yet. <laughs> he also came seventh in last year's version of Survivor. He's an absolute champ, Simon yeah. Black, and one of the best people we meet. What do you think you would do on a reality TV show like that? Like Survivor? Yes. Nah. <laughs> no, I'd be, I would love to go on it, but I'd be voted out very quickly. Why is that? Well, because I've got 
chicken arms and useless in a challenge. <laughs> I'm no, I, don't, I can't understand how you form alliances. Well, You're very bad at that. Yeah, not sure it'd be <laughs> what my about go. You? No, I don't think it'd be my go either. I like this reality show we're doing right now, Joe. Yeah. I think we'll stick to that. That's all we have time for today. You can head to our website to find out more about anything we've covered. And don't miss Joe and Emma Murray's podcast. More great content coming up as always. Joe, what have you and Emma been up to? Yes, with fantastic sports stars. If you're talking AFL, we have Gold Coast superstar Brandon Ellis and we've got uh, sprinter Morgan Mitchell. We know that we love her. So that's best of you in the House of Wellness. You can download it at podcast1australia.com.au. And you can always tune into Joe's radio show with GQ every Sunday. Don't miss that. And finally, thanks as always to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. Until next time, stay safe and stay well. Share the time with friends. Feel